commit everything you do to the Lord, trust him, and he will help you. Meaning the more you commit your ways to God, the more he's going to grow your destiny. The more he's going to grow this favor upon your life. God, I commit everything to you. I'll follow you. So here's what I need you to understand. Direction in life is not based upon your feelings. It's based upon God's word. What has God spoken over you? Because he's always speaking. The problem is we're not always listening. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. If you're struggling right now and saying, God, I don't know what I want and I'm not happy, listen to this. Don't worry about anything worry about anything. <laughs> I feel like we kind of chuckle on the inside. Like, Pastor, you have no idea what I'm dealing with. No, listen, this is from God. This is his word, not me. God is speaking to you saying, don't worry about anything. Why? But instead, pray and ask God for everything that you need. The father is literally speaking to his children saying, stop worrying about all these things in your life. Come to me instead. I'm the only one that can fix it. I'm the only one that can give you what you need. Even though there may be trials in your life, I'll walk you through it in the end. So come to me, pray to me, always giving thanks for what you have. And because you belong to Christ Jesus, I love this, God's peace will stand guard over your thoughts, over your feelings. I can be misleading right, or influenced by others or the situation you're in, and his peace can do this far better than our own human minds. And I'm teaching you this because this is what I believed knocked Elijah off course. His desires started to battle the desires of God for his life because he became afraid of what was spoken by Queen Jezebel, okay? So let's get into this. Who is Queen Jezebel? She is the evil queen of Israel, Okay, sounds like a Disney movie. She's the evil queen of Israel. She's far worse than King Ahab, and everybody knows her reputation. It's barbaric. In fact, she's the one calling all the shots. It was her that made sure that everybody would worship these false gods, and anybody who stood in her way, you're dead. You're taken out. Nobody would oppose her. First Kings chapter 18, verse 4. Once when Jezebel had tried to kill all the Lord's prophets... Obadiah had hidden a hundred of them in two caves, okay? And she would destroy anyone who would oppose her. And she hated Elijah. Why? Because he just killed off her prophets. All of them, remember? 850 prophets on Mount Carmel. He took every one of them down because they couldn't perform a miracle because their God's not gonna come rescue them because there's only one true God. Yeah, he's the one that stood up to them, right? And so she says this. Listen to her anger. First Kings 19 verses 1 through 3. When King Ahab got home, he told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, including the way he killed all the prophets of Baal. So Jezebel sent the message to Elijah. May the gods strike me and even kill me by this time tomorrow if I have not killed you just as you have killed them. And then what, what does it say? Elijah was afraid and he fled for his life. My question still is, why? Why was he so bold to stand up against 850 prophets, yet all of a sudden, Queen Jezebel's words strike fear and terror into his heart that he has to run away. And here's my conclusion. Listen to this. He was running away because at this point, he no longer knew what he wanted. His desires were competing with the desires from God. How do we know this? Let me show you the verses. First Kings chapter 19, verse three and four says, Elijah was afraid and he fled for his life. So verse three tells us that Elijah left to save his life, right? But then the very next verse tells us what? Elijah prayed. He said, I've had enough, Lord. Take my life. Which one is it, Elijah? What do you want? Are you running to save your life or do you want God to end your life? Elijah truly no longer knew what he wanted because his fear on the inside was overcoming his peace of what God was doing. But I'm going to show you even a new revelation today of what he really was afraid of, okay? So point number two is this. We believe the lie that it's easier to run from our problems, right? We believe this lie in our heads that it's easier to run away from all of our problems. Oh, somebody hurt you? Somebody said something bad about you? Just leave them. 
Don't talk to them again. Just never see them again. Maybe it's a family member that says something about you and you had these relationships that were scarred due to one argument and you walked away and you never talked again until somebody got sick, until somebody got hurt or somebody died. And it's in those moments, what do we usually say? I wish, I wish I would have just reached out. I wish I would have forgiven them, or I wish we could have just communicated one more time and just really discussed the things that we were dealing with in life because it's really hard, and now it's too late. For some reason, we think it's easier to run away from these problems, or maybe it's a communication problem in a relationship, things you're not really talking about, and you're just avoiding, pretending like it's no big deal, but one day, what, what's going to happen? That bitterness is going to explode out of you because you didn't talk about it because you didn't accept peace in a situation or you run from places. You will run from your environment. You run from a job every time it gets hard. You run from a commitment every time it gets difficult. Why? Because we believe the lie that running away from our problems is easier. Elijah, listen to this, was not running for his life, but he was actually running away from his life. That's what he's doing. And I'm going to show you how the text. He was not running for his life. He was running away from his life. He was running away from his problems. He was not afraid of death. He was afraid of facing more trials. He was afraid of going through something again. And this is why his desires started to compete with the desires of God over his life. Why? Because it had been three long years of difficulties, of trials. Three long years. And he told God in chapter 19, verse four, what was the first thing he said before he said, Lord, take me out? He said, Lord, I've had enough. I've just, I've, I've had enough of being hated, hated and threatened because you used me and my mouth to stop the rain. I've had to wait on my food served by a dirty bird. Yes, it was a miracle at first, but now I have to wait for these scavengers to bring me my food. I've traveled from one uncomfortable situation to another. Can you imagine the stress? Seriously, can you imagine it? Like everywhere you stay, somebody might kill you. Somebody might hurt you. Somebody might take you out. Can you imagine the trials that he went through over and over again? And I believe Elijah came to this point where he's saying, God, I've just had enough. I don't want to fight another trial. I know what you have for me is good in the end, but I'm done being hated. I'm just done. And so I started to think about this church plant. And I remember the story that in the beginning, when me and my wife were first moving out here from Louisiana to North Carolina, we had no idea we were going to plant a church. That wasn't the mission. We just knew that God was calling us out to North Carolina. I thought I was going to work at a church, and I thought everything was going to be okay. It was still a big faith risk for us. It was going to be hard for at least the next six months, so we thought. It went a lot longer than that. But we took this risk. But before we moved out here, one of our friends called us because she had a dream. And in that dream, she told us, she says, I saw y'all go to North Carolina, and she said, y'all planted a church. And it became very big. And if you remember the story, because I've shared it before, what was my response? No. (laughs) Nope, that wasn't me. That wasn't a dream about us. That is not going to happen. I don't want to go through that again. Why would I say something like that? Because a few years back, Authentic was actually an evangelistic outreach in uh, Louisiana. And it was a difficult time. Yes, there were supernatural things that happened in my life, and I'm so grateful for the things that I was taught. But at the same time, listen, there were many trials I never would have faced again. There were people that I loved that walked away. I stepped away from a paycheck for a while. I made many, many mistakes, and I struggled to keep going because of so many voices of fear in my head. Why am I doing this? What is this for? How are we going to keep making this? When is this going to end? So many tears upon my soul. And so as I read the story of Elijah, I can fully relate to him saying, God, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't want to go through another trial. I'd rather run away and be comfortable in the wilderness and just die because I don't want to deal with another, another difficult situation. Yeah, God, I know you can do it. I know you got miracles, but I'm just tired of dealing with bad people. I'm tired of keeping up the faith. I completely relate to how Elijah felt at this moment, and I bet you can too because I bet there's something in your life right now that you've tried so hard. 
hard to achieve, to get to. And it's like, once you receive those miracles, you're kind of like, okay, God, this is it. But then there's another trial. God, I didn't ask for another one. And then there's another trial. God, I didn't ask for that one either. You told me this was it. Yeah, but if God told you everything, you never would have stepped out on faith because you have to go through the process. You have to learn these lessons to understand how good God is. So when the story, Elijah is running away from God, so what did God do? Did he condemn him? Punish him? Elijah, you're running away from me. You're not listening to my voice. How dare you? No, he fed him. He gave him food. He nourished his body and his soul. First Kings chapter 19, verses five through eight, an angel touched him and told him, get up and eat. He looked around and there beside his head was some bread baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and he drank and he lay down again. Then the angel of the Lord came again and touched him and said, get up and eat some more or the journey will be too much for you. Listen to his words, eat, drink. The journey ahead will be too much for you to be able to handle. And so, and the food gave him enough strength to travel for how long? 40 days, 40 nights? Sound familiar? Jesus was in the wilderness fasting for what? 40 days, 40 nights. The Israelites wandered the wilderness for 40 years. So for 40 days and 40 nights, he traveled to Mount Sinai, the mountain of God by himself, which means that this food that the Lord provided nourished him enough to make this long journey. And then if you keep reading the story, it says that he came to a cave and he spent the night in that cave. Okay, God didn't punish Elijah. He fed him. He cooked him a healthy meal. Elijah said, Lord, take my life. But God said, that's not what you need. That's not what I have for you. You're asking me to take your life because you don't understand. But what I'm going to do is nourish your body and your soul. I'm going to encourage you. I'm going to help you keep going in life because there's still much more to be done. Meaning, listen to this. When you do not spend time in the presence of God, you will always feel malnourished. You understand? Because it's very easy to do. It's very easy to get busy in life where I got to be here and I got I to get this achievement and I got to do this and I got to make sure these problems are fixed and I got things in my house I got to do. I got children to raise. I got to go here. I got to do this. I got to do that. And you're stressed to the max where you want to pull out your hair. And it's in those moments, what do you tell God? I'm done, right? Why? Because we're so stressed. I am done. I can't handle this any more. And that's why when Jesus was fasting, you remember how he rebuked Satan? In Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, what did he say? He said, people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. It's funny to me now that back then I told God, no, God didn't listen to that. (laughs) He brought me here. He brought my family here. He brought you here through all the ups and downs. And that's why we're seeing this miracle today. This church today standing here, being here is already a miracle. But I believe that many, many more miracles are in store as long as we keep believing him and following God's desires and not our own. Because a long time ago, despite my own desires, I realized that I must choose God's desires for my life. Because when you choose his desires, in the end, you never regret it. 